happened. Now, why has it happened? I mean, it is different from other people's views, I imagine. Um, the simple answer is this tension between time and space. Mm. That is that if you allow either of these dimensions in human history to crush the other, if you, if you allow, you become too concerned with the present as most of my anthropological colleagues are, then you don't understand anything. I mean, I read you know, lots of books about China or, um, I mean, I'm reading a very good one, uh, one at the moment. I mean, it's good in a, a way by an American about the uh, One Belt, One Road project and mm -hmm. the Silk Road and so on. And it's good in a way because he, but it's hopeless in another. He, he starts, you know, three years ago or 10 years ago or whenever they started the One Belt, One Road. Nothing on Chinese history, nothing on what the Chinese uh, ideology, mentality, morality, what they think they're trying to do, what the deeper essence of China is as we see it over 2000 years. And therefore, it's all basically just saying, well, this bit works and that bit doesn't work and it won't go on or it will go on. So it's all temporocentric. And any treatment of any anywhere like China or England or Japan or anywhere, France, you know, that, that doesn't take into account its history is not going to get anywhere. Um, on the other hand, if you limit yourself to history, as many of my historian friends do, you find that the, the questions you ask become increasingly trivial because they are set by the constraints of the period you are studying. So if you are an expert on 17th century France or England, your questions will be set by what interested them and, and what your other colleagues. And also you get caught within the much deeper and more difficult to analyze constraints of your fellow, uh, your, your colleagues, because you will write for them. You will know what they've read. You'll know what they will accept and disagree with. And so you'll narrow down um, your ambitions to either proving them right or wrong or expanding a little bit. And that, that means that the, the real questions you should be asking, which are neither ones which are set by the present in the sense of being temporocentric and projecting them back, but nor are they the questions that people at the time would have set they have to come from a long way outside the whole thing. You have to rise right above it. And also they, the questions, if you're a historian, uh, you have to ask, will not, not be answered by looking at just that particular, say 17th century France. And this is the point that's made by Tocqueville uh, in that lovely giveaway phrase he has in one of his letters or somewhere. He said, when I was writing about America, every sentence I wrote, I was thinking France. about France. Yeah. And that uh, that's something that comes across with your, right, this comparative method is very central to what you're up to, isn't it, really? Well, all, all the time, I mean, we don't know what we're thinking about. We're, we're as um, uh, I, I often discuss this with Jerry Martin, and he said, you know, all disciplines are comparativists. Mm. He, he used to talk to the Nobel Prize winning uh, Dr. Black, who um, made some great breakthrough. And uh, Black used to say, we are all comparativists. Everything we say, every sentence, you know this as a philosopher, you know, every um, assertion in philosophy is in contradiction distinction to something else. Um, and therefore we have to think like that. It's, it's not just in the West. Every, a child has to think about that when they make, you know, this is right, this is wrong, this is black, this is hot, this is, everything is in comparison to something else which is different. And most historians never formally make a model or search for a model of 
what to compare with what. So most of my friends take as their model, say a historian of 17th century England, um, a friend of mine, say in a Cambridge College who studies 17th century England, will assume that the model is a, a, a 20, 20th century Cambridge academic. That, that is your model of the world. What were they like in the 17th century? Well, you know, they were this or that, indifferent from me. That's all. But if you stretch it to say, how were they different from a Chinese or a Japanese or a Nepalese or um, whatever, then immediately you ask, and they, the odd thing is that um, in history, we were told not to do this and not to ask these sort of wider questions because there was no evidence. This was the thrust of a lot of Geoffrey Elton's work that the good historian is the person who knows not only how to ask interesting questions, but questions to which they could possibly get an answer. There's absolutely no point in asking, you know, what did people in the 17th century dream about? Because we have no way of knowing what they dream and dreamt about. Maybe interesting question, but there's no answer. Therefore, forget it. You know, don't waste your time. But the odd thing is that by changing the questions, you actually change the past. You change what is in the past. This is sort of implied by Collingwood in his philosophy of history, that we construct and invent the past we make it, and we make it, um, he said, the, you know, the Galilean uh, revolution in history is when you realize that you are not given the past by a set of facts. You look back and you construct it, and that's what science does. It constructs new truths through theoretical frameworks. And what um, having a new framework of questions did for me was that it suddenly opened out whole sets of actual data because um, the data is there. If you have the theoretical frame to connect it, it's, it's fragments. And if you approach it without a, a model, you won't see the connection or even see the fragments. It suddenly is revealed to you. And this, this is a, a point made by Mark Bloch, that basically the historian takes evidence from all sorts of different places, all sorts of sources, and then recreates them into answers to questions. And if you don't have the theoretical model, as in my witchcraft case or others, mm. uh, you won't find any evidence. People had not found that evidence. And so having a much wider theoretical framework uh, constructs worlds which have vanished because we had no way of beginning to understand them. This is uh, related to a, a, a really um, one of my favorite quotations from Collingwood, which is that, and he believed, and he said that, um, although we have a lot of data about Roman religion, there is no way hmm. given our uh, what we know in our current civilization, that we can understand it. We can't think like a Roman. And of course you can't if you're Collingwood in 20th century Oxford, sitting in wherever he was. But if you've been to uh, China and seen ancestor veneration, for example, or polytheism, or an agnatic kinship system, working you know, patrilineal descent clan system uh, or an imperial system like in China. And then you go with that to ancient Rome. Then you can understand it. And I, I first actually experienced this, I think, or at least one case of this, again, looking at my LSE notes. When I was at the LSE, just before I went to the LSE, a young academic who had been a research fellow at King's College called Keith Hopkins. Um, he'd uh, been a brilliant student at Oxford, I mean at, at Cambridge at King's, 
And then they decided that Roman civilization was no longer being taught at the LSE in about 1964-5. Why not get this young Hopkins man? And Keith came and I went to his lectures, uh, which I mainly remember because he was lecturing during the 1968 troubles and uh, he had a lecture audience of sort of 15, 20 people. And then I turned up one day and there was only me. <laughs> and I said, where are the rest of them, Keith? And he said, don't you know that there's a picket, picketing on and the school's closed down and I'm not meant to lecture to you. <laughs> but since you're here, I'll tell you. Anyway, How do you get through? This is the question that we're all wanting to know. Well, I didn't notice. I was in a <laughs> usual dream. I just walked through. Um, anyway, Keith had read a lot of sociology and anthropology. He, he wrote one of the most important articles, actually, in one part of anthropology, which was about brother-sister marriage in ancient Egypt and showing that the incest taboo is not universal. Anyway, Keith lectured, and I see from my notes, which I completely forgotten, his lectures were on comparing Chinese and Roman civilization, mainly demographic, but also other aspects of it. So he brought these two together. And so he became an expert on comparative sociology and Roman history. And he was rather like Ernest, someone who held professorships at, at the LSE, he became a lecturer and then a reader in sociology. When he back, went back to Cambridge, and I shared a room with him for 15 years, I mean, a set in Cambridge with him. When he went to Cambridge, he became professor of classical history. And so he, he knew his sources and his, you know, he read all this stuff and knew classical, but he brought the questions of sociology to it. He was also professor of sociology at Brunel University for some years. So he was like Ernest in these two fields. He's the only other person I know who was really uh, happy. And if you, I mean, if you want to see him in action, um, that LSE seminar, which Ernest is in, and yeah. uh, he was one of the main contributors to that. So um, I learned from the LSE that bringing these things together generates a lot of recreates our, our history it, it changes it makes it possible to see what was impossible before it's like glass or something like that